Now, I'm afraid I don't have a title. I'm just plain old Stephen Walker. Um, my day job is, as Tim says, political correspondent, which means I spend a lot of time with politicians, which doesn't make me a bad person. Um, and it is lovely to be here tonight because we are celebrating Don Patrick's um, famous son, most famous son, and it is a fantastic place to be. I have to just say slightly that there is competition, obviously, for St. Patrick. Um, I was brought up in Ballymena with tales of St. Patrick on Slamish, uh, and I have to say, as you know, the people of Ballymena claim him as well, um, and the saint is very much part of civic life uh, in Ballymena. But we don't have a wonderful centre like this. Uh, we don't have this, so you are very, very lucky. And maybe Balamina should have a centre like this, Baroness Paisley. Maybe I should talk to the MP for the year. <laughs> um, do you know who that is? Could you help me? <laughs> maybe we should have words after this to say if Balamina can have a wonderful centre like that. Anyway, the, the, the purpose of tonight um, is to be very in informal, to just talk really about um, St. Patrick, about your views on St. Patrick, about your faith, um, and then take some, some questions afterwards. So let's start. I know you are a woman of, of strong faith. I've interviewed you before, we've, we've chatted before, but just tell us the importance of your faith to your life. Well, my faith is the centre of my life, really, uh, because uh, life is only for a short time, no matter how long we live, and we've been hearing tonight in our conversation before th this meeting um, of t two of our friends whose parents are in their 90s. And, uh, well, I haven't quite reached 90, but I'm not as they would say in the country, a beagle's gout off it. <laughs> uh, in case you don't know, that's a beagle's bark. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, as a young, I was brought up, first of all, in a home where God's word was read every evening. I remember my dad lifting me onto his knee while uh, at the same time reaching to, for the family Bible and he read it as we sat around the fire. And I was taught and listened. I didn't understand it all. I still don't understand it all. But I love it. I love uh, it because it's God's word. And because in it I find the words eternal life. I was brought up on it. And I, I can still remember little verses my dad taught me while I was just a little thing before I could walk. And he was teaching me these little things from the Bible. Uh, and so it was the centre really of our home and uh, in my own home, as my daughters will tell you, uh, the Bible was the centre in our home. We had <coughs> I read from its pages every day we read a chapter and in fact it's where our children I think uh, first learned to read because uh, we had uh, the Bibles, each child had a Bible and we read round, we took a chapter or a book and read that chapter uh, together and the children learned to read around the table and before they started school they, they knew words but uh, as I say it's, it's the centre point uh, the centre of my life in it I find as it says the words of eternal life and they are come unto me all ye who labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest and uh, I have found that true in my life and all the ups and downs that uh, the word of God indeed and God himself through his, the death of his son on Calvary uh, is my closest friend. I, I rely on my conversations with him just quietly from my heart uh, going to his and I know that God does answer prayers, answer them abundantly for me. And do you think your faith has changed in, in, throughout the years? I mean, the faith that you had, say, as a 25-year-old, is that different to the faith that you have now? Is it the same? I, no, it's stronger. My faith today is stronger. Why is that? Uh, well, I think as you grow older, you become more aware that uh, life isn't forever. It ends at some time. And to be in, in the Bible, you have... <coughs> 
how to uh, obtain or attain eternal life uh, through simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his death on Calvary and in his shed blood. Of the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And that is the most wonderful thing about it all. I can stand before God. I can confess my sins to him. I don't need to go over them one by one because he already knows. But I talk to, to my Savior every day, two or three times a day when I'm in trouble. I will lift my heart to him. But I, you don't need to kneel down. You don't need to have your eyes closed because your communication is from your heart to his. And I find that uh, he has always fulfilled all my needs. And has it changed? It has grown stronger. Yes, it has grown stronger. And you've been in the public eye mm -hmm. for m many decades. Yeah. Um, as Tim was saying in the introduction, you mean you had a, you had a, a career in your own right in the city hall, in the assembly. Obviously, your, your husband was leader of the DUP and first minister, so you, uh, so you are, there was a lot of pressure. Yeah. And how did that test your faith? Well, it does <coughs> test your faith. Uh, but I found uh, that uh, not so much my faith, but the person in whom my faith is founded and grounded, he is the one that has made it easy for me and helped me to get through. I couldn't have got through on my own. I just couldn't have. Without faith, you Without, think it would, it wouldn't I, have been possible? I do not know what I would have done if I couldn't turn to Christ. And um, do you think it makes it harder for Christians to be in the public eye? Because do you think the expectations are bigger because of people of faith? Yes, I think it can be because people think that you're sort of holy and you're above everybody else. And they, I think other people sometimes think that, oh, he thinks he's better than everybody else, or she thinks she's better. I don't, uh, and I, a, a true Christian does not, because we know there's no good thing. Uh, the Apostle Paul could say, no good thing dwells in my body. How much more can I say that with all my faults and shortcomings? And I know them. I know my faults only too well. You think it's a misconception that people look at people of faith and say, oh, they're putting themselves on a pedestal. Yes, they're saying, uh -huh. because I am a yes. person of faith. That's right. Um, I therefore am in some way better no, than other people. No, I am not. I, I would not put myself above every, anybody because I'm not above anybody. Do you think I'm faith... Equal with the poorest person or the richest person. Uh, talking of riches, uh, my riches aren't to do with this earth. They've got to do with eternity. When you have, when you have Christ, you have riches untold. Beyond, beyond money, without money and without price. Are there any big moments in your life when you can recall your faith being really tested and, and feeling that you needed help? Oh, yes, <laughs> scores of them over and over again. And uh, I've always found that, uh, you know, I just, I don't need to go down on my knees and call on God. I can just call him from where I am. And uh, he's just given me the strength and the grace to deal with whatever the problem is. It's nothing in me. We went through decades of the troubles, yeah. uh, and your husband was at the front line of news and all kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. How did that test your faith? Well, I knew the, the stories a lie, I, the difference between the truth and the lies. And I mean, they're still broadcasting lies about him, even though he's over five years gone from this earth. Uh, I still hear and uh, read stories about them, which are absolutely without foundation. You know, so uh, it doesn't doesn't fit, bother me in the least because I know they're not true. And if you if somebody tells lies about you, you know that uh, they are lies. Then you have nothing to fear because you can face anybody. And uh, I mean, there were key moments. Mm -hmm. For example, when uh, your husband went to prison. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that must have been a key moment of your faith being tested. Yeah. No, it, it didn't test my faith. No, no, I just, because I knew Ian was doing what was right. And uh, uh, I supported him all the way. 
And in terms of looking back, are there any other big moments where you feel your faith had been challenged or without your faith you would have found it hard to get through? There's lots of things that I would have found, I think, most things that I would have found difficult, difficult without that faith. I remember you and I having a conversation about um, going into government mm -hmm. with Sinn Féin. Yeah. And I remember you telling me that you and Ian had lots of conversations. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure you will, but if, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had a conversation with, with your husband and after the election and you said, look, we are the largest unionist party, Sinn Féin are the largest nationalist party. We are Democrats. Mm -hmm. We go into power with Sinn Féin. Mm -hmm. Was that a moment of... That, was that a moment where faith was important or yes. helped? Well, because we, that really was a big moment. It was a big moment, and we knew, and I know uh, Martin McGuinness also knew he had enemies on his part, on his side of the political and religious divide, that hated the thought of him and in meeting and talking together. But it, it didn't faze me in the least, you know that. This was going to happen. I knew there would be trouble, and I knew there would be all sorts of accusations and things. We all, we all knew that, but um, it was the right thing to do at the right time. And before that, Ian had not the he hadn't the backing behind him that he could do that. And uh, but they did. They made a tremendous they did, made a tremendous impact in Northern Ireland, and the people. That, that followed them and kept it going, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. You believe that? I believe that, certainly. And Ian had a, a unique relationship with Martin yeah, McGuinness, yes. and they talked about faith, didn't they? They did, they did. It was one of the first things they did talk about. And did they pray together? Or? Well, Ian prayed for with him. He did every day, every day. Uh, our, our life, really, uh, every day, as a family, we prayed together. When there were just the two of us, we prayed together. When the children came at the start home, of the day, at the start of the day, yes. And uh, <coughs> we committed to our lives and our way, and whatever we did, and just asked for God's guidance as we, as we, the day proceeded. <coughs> and uh, it was the same then. And he went in every morning, and he said, the first morning they met, you know. <coughs> started in St. Martin I pray every morning we go to pray every morning and Martin was absolutely open to that and I think that made a big impact on his life and on his friendship you know and uh, it, uh, it certainly there was a change in, in the country because for the first time things were working really wonderfully after such a long time when they weren't and uh, then after Martin's death, I think, things went down. So they, they physically prayed together in the same office? Ian prayed with him every morning. Every, without fail? Every morning without fail. Mm -hmm. And um, when Ian wasn't well, Martin came to the house and, and, and he, he was did. quite a, a regular visitor. Well, he came twice. He came when Ian, before Ian took ill, just after, when Ian had retired, he came up phone passed. He said he would have come up, so I said, certainly. And he did, and when Ian died, he phoned me and said he would like to come and know that. He said, I know the house is strictly private, but would it be all right if I came? And I said, certainly, Martin, it would. And he did, he came, and he went in to the room where Ian's uh, coffin was, and he stood over it, and his, his eyes filled with tears, and that, that touched me too, because it showed the, the relationship that the two men had was genuine and he he meant well and I think if he had if his life had been spared and uh, Ian's life they things would have you know kept improving. <coughs> things would have been very different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And without Martin McGuinness's faith and without your husband's faith, do you think that would have been a completely different relationship? Well, I know, I know everything in, in the last one's life did depend on his faith. Uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't know, but Martin did say to me that uh, he, his life had been changed, you know, because of 
the association that he had with Ian was totally unique and totally unexpected. And of course, uh, somebody christened them the Chuckle Brothers. Chuckle Brothers. Yes. But, uh, Do you think that was unfair, or did you like that? I thought it was. I thought it was quite funny because I said, "Well, at least you know, there's something to chuckle about, which we haven't had for a bit." Yeah. And uh, since the demise of both of them, we haven't had much to chuckle. There could have been worse nicknames. <coughs> a lot worse. <laughs> Not broadcast before the watershed, but nonetheless. <laughs> Um, let's talk. We talked a bit about your background and your. Let's talk a little bit about uh, St. Patrick. Um, what does he mean to you? Well, I, I, he was an example. You know, everything in his life uh, was an example, and him com coming here or being here and uh, doing what he did. I think it, it's it's a, it's a very good example and. It, it was evidenced by his life. He wrote a book here on Patrick, the uh, Apostle of Ireland, and uh, the, the, the man and his message. And it's uh, it's very a very interesting little book. And I was looking at some of the things that uh, uh, Patrick said. Uh, I pray God that he may give me perseverance and count me worthy to render myself a faithful witness to him. And that was a very big thing. And Patrick did that, didn't he? Yes. By all the things that he did. And uh, he, he was a devoted uh, believer in Christ. And in, in the death of, of Christ on Calvary, he knew all about that. And that was the foundation of his faith. And that's the foundation of my faith. It was the foundation of Ian's faith. And uh, that is what made Patrick famous. What of those who who see St. Patrick <coughs> simply as a patron saint for one side of the community? Mm -hmm. what, what do you say to, to those people? Well, he, people are the same. You know, you, you don't you don't look at people because of what their religious beliefs are. You know, whenever you um, go into a hospital, you don't ask a doctor, are you a Catholic or a Protestant? You know. You, you just, just want to know if they're qualified. You just, yes, you just <laughs> want to know if they're you know, And uh, that, you know, that doesn't bother me at all. I, I don't see people as Catholics or Protestants or Hottentots or Jews or anything else. I see them all as equal and that Christ died for them all. So we're all the same. And without him, we're all sinners. But the, the, the point I mean, the perception of St. Patrick's Day mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. some look at it and say that's simply that's simply for one side yeah. of the community. Well, it's uh, not. Uh -huh. you, 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 no, 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 no. And you think some people have just simply got that wrong? That's a, a wrong well, perception. It's just a wrong conception. Yeah. Forgiveness was an important part mm -hmm. of St. Patrick's life. Mm -hmm. um, as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the most difficult things to do, do you yes, think? Yes, it is. It is. There's no doubt about it. It is. It takes an awful lot of thought, I think, first of all, it, it's about yourself. Uh, are you really willing to do this? Are you genuine in your forgiveness? You know, and uh, whenever, you, whenever you find that, when you look at another person, look into the eyes of another person, you know, you're saying, yourself only in another uh, form, another, and as another person, and you, you, you realise that you're not above them or they're above you, we're equal. It is hard, isn't it? I, I don't think it's, it's hard to, to, to say you're equal with somebody else, you're, you have equal rights, you have equal, you know. The, the other thing that... Um, with difficulties. St. Patrick is known for is that he came back mm -hmm. to Ireland. Yeah. And, and in a sense, he didn't have to do that, but he came back mm -hmm. to spread the gospel. Yes. In a sense, mm -hmm. that was the hard route. Yes. Um, yes. It, it, is there a lesson there that, that in life, mm -hmm. don't always take the easy route? Sometimes you have to Absolutely. take the hard sometimes route. Sometimes you do, yes, and sometimes it's costly, personally, uh, costly to you. Uh, but th that's not important, really, in, in the overall uh, scene of life, the overall picture. You mentioned 
uh, your husband's book about St. Patrick he clearly was a key figure to, to Ian, wasn't he? Yes, oh yes, Ian, Ian that was a great St. Patrick man, uh -huh, mm. he was. He was a great admirer of him mm. and all that he did. And he faced a lot of opposition in a way. St. Patrick was quite fearless, wasn't he? He was. He was. What do you think today we can learn from St. Patrick? Is there a, a legacy there? Are there things we can pick up from the way he behaved? Well, the word. The, we're st people are still the same, you know, no matter uh, what what your background is or anything else. Yeah, people are still the same. And Patrick, I think, if, if people read some of the sayings, they would uh, get to understand that too. Yeah. And do you think he is simply the father of, of Christianity in, in Ireland? Is that how you look at him? In a, in a sense of, of so, yeah, bringing well, the gospel uh -huh. here. Yeah. Well, if it, anyone who brings the gospel uh, to a country or to a, even to a family or personally, yes, I do think that they're, they are very important. Mm -hmm. And in terms of celebrating the life of um, St. Patrick, what do places like this mean, do you think? Well, I suppose these places, are, well, they're specially set up, and I think it's a great centre, you mm -hmm. know, to, to spread the, the uh, story of Patrick and all that he did and all that he still means to the people of Northern Ireland, and Ireland, I suppose, in general. Mm -hmm. If there were key things to learn, would forgiveness be the key, do you think? Forgiveness would be one of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of um, making it relevant today, I mean, we do, we do live in a very 24-hour news <coughs> society. We live in social media. There's an awful lot of pressure on people. And do you sense that it's hard to get that Christian message out? Well, I think it, 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 it is hard because people are so caught up that today in their own lives, you know, I think we're more isolated and insulated than we used to be because there were no such television was unheard of when I was a child growing up. And uh, uh, a radio was something special that not everybody had. And people were more open with one another, <coughs> more friendly, I think, with one another. We weren't so insulated as we, and isolated as we would be today. As we would be today, we have our little families and our little friendships, but uh, Patrick was speaking to a largely uneducated people, and uh, I think we need to get out uh, and uh, talk to other people about our faith, and, <coughs> you know, and spread it and not be afraid to talk about it. <coughs> Do you think it's hard to be a Christian in 2020? know that it's, I suppose it is hard, but I don't look on it as hard. You know, I think you, you take a stand, everybody has their own right, you know, and their own uh, beliefs, and they've every right to those beliefs, whatever they are. But uh, whenever you do try to, to uh, take a stand or make a stand, uh, there's usually a price to pay, you know, for that. You're mocked, you're misunderstood quite a bit. And then, I know you're out of the political sphere, but in the political sphere, and you know, you, I'm sure you, you and Ian talked about this a lot, there are key decisions that are made or can be made that impact on your Christian beliefs. You'd say, you know, um, use two examples abortion, same sex marriage, things that are in the public domain, yes. and that tests your faith, but it also tests your belief of what is right for the public and what should yeah. you be doing yeah. for the greater good. Well, that, that is true, especially these uh, the, the two things you've mentioned, abortion for one of them, and uh, same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage, yes. 
both of those are <coughs> against all that God teaches and as a believer in, in God's Son and in God, uh, I cannot accept those as being right. What God has condemned, we cannot say that it's right. We cannot make it right. And, uh, you know, whenever you think of, of the, uh, the change around <coughs> the, the there's not the same uh, principles, I think, in life when, since these things have been made so big, abortion and that. Um, abortion is just murder in the womb. I'm just using them necessarily yes. as examples yes. where, as a public figure, your faith is tested because you think public policy or public ideas are going yes, against you. Yes, of course. People, people don't like you to say that these things are wrong because, well, everybody else is doing it too. It's all right. But it isn't because anything that God condemns in his, in his word and in the commandments, thou shalt not kill. Abortion is just killing. It's plain killing. A killing of a, 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 and who know of an innocent unborn child and it's it's uh, legal now right up to birth which is just beyond description do you think faith is evolving and flexible in any way well, no there's things that are are not flexible the commandments <coughs> are not flexible uh, they're made they were made for our benefit. And people think they know more than God. They think they, they uh, are above learning. They think they are above these things. And you can just do what you like and get away with it. Well, you might do that for a little while, but there's a payday coming. One sooner or later, if not in time, it will come in eternity. And in terms of the general political debate, do you think the issue of faith has got lost? Yes, it has. And just before we move to a close, I'd quite like to ask you about your, your views of where we're at at the moment. I'm sure you're a key watcher on events on the hill, and uh, tonight discussions are still ongoing. I wonder yeah. what you thought or what you hoped might happen. Well, I hope and pray that something will we can't, we can't go on like this. We just cannot go on. Uh, and something has got to give, and somebody has got to give, and what that giving is, is very important, you know, that, that it, it is done. Otherwise, what, what are we going to do? What are our, our, everything, the health service, the education, everything that's vital to life, is is all uh, messed up because of a handful of people will not come to terms with doing the things that are right. Yeah. It's obviously been three years. It's it's hard to yeah. imagine in many ways. It is, it? and it, it's dreadful. I, I my heart goes out to the people, the children at school, to the teachers, to the nurses, the doctors all that's going on. Look at the strikes that are going on now, which must be awful for the health service. Um, and the pe people that are lying in hospital beds, and some of them not even to get in bed, sitting in chairs for hours and hours in the end. And that should not be happening. That should not be happening in this country, of all countries. And when uh, Martin McGuinness resigned mm -hmm. three years ago, I mean, what, did, what did you think? Did you think he was right or wrong? Or? Well, I I don't uh, I I don't I don't know. I wish he, I just wish he hadn't. Uh, but I can't be the judge, you know, of that. I wish he, he hadn't, and I wish he hadn't been put in that position where he felt he must. And do you think? The two parties, Sinn Féin and the DUP, are, are miles apart, or do you think that the, the gaps, they can get back around the table? Well, they ought to. They've, they've got to do something. They cannot go on like this. Uh, otherwise, this country is going to be absolutely up in arms. People will get angry. We have taken so much we've been patient on both sides of the, of the uh, situation. And... Uh, 
I think something certainly will, will has to be done. Are you hopeful? I, I am hopeful, but I, I keep hoping and I keep praying. But I, what, what worries me is uh, is the is the uh, tendency and, and the the way uh, Sinn Féin on their part are uh, holding out for uh, what they're holding at, at the minute for uh, Irish language. At the Irish language act. I mean, I don't think we need an Irish language act any more than we need a Scotch Irish act. Um, I think it's just as something that they are they are wanting. They want everything on their terms, and I think they've got to. The Sinn Féin might say the DUP want everything on no. their terms. Well, they might. But what what I want as an individual is that freedom for everybody, no matter what their religion or no matter what their politics are. We shouldn't be tied down in in these matters, in such matters as these. And is there, is there a um, sadness or a personal sadness there? Because I remember uh, your son Ian talking on BBC about the relationship between Ian and Martin McGuinness and yeah. what they had built up. When you look at an empty storm, and do yes. you think mm -hmm. these are missed opportunities? Yes, they are missed opportunities. They are indeed. And uh, how, how they're going to get out of it is, is beyond me, but there's got to be something. There's got to be something. Sinn Féin can't have their own way. Uh, I, I d don't say that the DUP should have their own way either. But surely to goodness, we're big enough and have been through enough to come to terms with, with uh, what life holds for us and what the future has. But our people, I don't care what people's religion is, anything else. As lo but I, what I do long for is a land, a country that is united in, in its care for one another. We need to care for one another. When I go into a hospital, uh, I don't ask for anything. I just want to be cured. We have politics and they need, we need to be cured. Politics needs to be cleaned up. And uh, I don't think Sinn Féin can keep I mean, their people are going, are suffering as much as the rest of us, and I don't see how they can claim to be a party of the people if they continue to deprive the people of their human and civil rights. And do you think it will happen? Do you think there will be a deal? Well, it's, it's impossible to say. I certainly hope and pray that something will happen, big or small, that will just make the difference that they, they can see sense for this the, 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 uh, this country and its people are bigger than petty little arguments we touched earlier about St. Patrick and we talked about his capacity mm -hmm. to forgive mm -hmm. do you think forgiveness is missing in politics yes <coughs> There's a lot of missing in politics. do you think that would improve the political debate yes yeah, I do. I, I think people do need to. They're sitting there and they're talking, and they're. It's as if there's no interest in the people that they're supposed to be representing, which is is absolutely disgraceful. Okay. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to keep some time for uh, questions, so maybe we just give a, a round of applause for that. <laughs> very much. Are, are there some questions from the floor? The gentleman here. Uh, good evening. I'm obviously not from here, as you can hear. Okay. Um, how many times has it happened, Mrs. Paisley, that you and your husband, the clash between political strategy and political decision making and your fate? How many times, I wouldn't say you had to choose between any two because you wouldn't, but how many times was there a conflict over the years between taking a political decision, short-term, long-term, and your faith? Uh, how many times did was there a conflict between political decision-making and your faith? Well, any time there was, 
uh, what we did, we just uh, said, well, look, we're going to pray about this. And we did. We knelt down together and prayed about it and asked for God's guidance. And uh, uh, we still do. He's not here, but I still do that. And I know uh, lots of other people do that too. And we just need to <coughs> look to, to God and trust in him. And he's, he tells us if we do that, that he will answer us. It mightn't be the way we want or the way we had hoped he would, but he does it for our benefit and uh, for his glory. Okay, so, a lady here at the front. Um, we have nurses who look after patients. We have doctors who treat patients. We have teachers who teach children. And they don't choose what children they're going to teach or patients that they're going to look after. Do you not think that um, religion should be taken out of politics? Religion is one, one thing, and uh, uh, I think faith is something else. Uh, but uh, I don't think things should be based on, on religion. You know, things like uh, everyday things, because you're one section of the community or another, we're all equal. And... Uh, I think sometimes our politicians forget that. Yes, but the decisions, some decisions are, should be taken more um, democratic, but a lot of decisions that we have taken on the hill um, are actually, they're, they're, they're coming from a religious um, angle that decisions are being made, and they're not actually maybe being taken on the good of our whole society. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to get sort of um, something for everybody. But we'll get for most people. Yeah. But with some of the parties up there, mm -hmm. we will not because they are so entrenched in what their religious beliefs mm -hmm. are that no sensible decisions are being made. <coughs> yeah, well. They, need to, they do need to rise above that and get that sorted out. And we can't do it for them. They've got to do it, you know. And they've got to be made aware that they've got to do it. Uh, otherwise, I, I just don't know what is going to happen. I just don't know. It's, it's very, very um, worrying, to say the least. On a more lighthearted note, can I maybe suggest that all the politicians are taken out and sacked? and that the jobs are given to nurses and doctors and <laughs> teachers. <laughs> it might be an idea. <laughs> gentleman, gentleman at the back over here. Thank you, Dr. Arlen Maisley. At the very commencement of your address, when Stephen asked you about you talking to your late husband about government, mm -hmm. you listed by saying, we are the largest party that the BBC. Sinn Féin is also the second largest party. We are Democrats, you said, mm -hmm. and therefore we should go into government. Mm -hmm. Now, taking that as your criteria for going into government, mm -hmm. my question is, that was in 2007. In 1998, the UUP was the largest party, the SDLP was the second largest party. On the 22nd of May, overwhelmingly, the peoples of Ireland endorsed the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And even in 2007, the IRA Army Council was still active. Sinn Féin still didn't recognize the legitimacy of Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom. So my question is, what changed from 1998 to 2007 that made you advocate that the DUP should form a government with Sinn Féin. We're getting pretty political. <laughs> uh, I, d I don't think we had enough. Uh, 
at that time, when did, when did we form the... the uh, when was 2007, you do, you have to win it. Yeah. He went in to... With Martin McGillis. With Seth. Yeah. Right, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you forget about at least I forget about dates and that. Um, I can't tell you, I can't answer for my husband <laughs> what he did at that time, but I know th that it so was... I was saying, interrupting, when you said when you advocated for your husband and answered his statements, I was saying not why did your husband, why did you say to do it in 2007, but didn't feel you should say to him in 1998 he should do it? What made you change? I don't know that I did change. <coughs> but what was your, I suppose in the part answer to, to Dermot's question, what was your thinking in 2000, your, your thinking in 2007 was the timing is now right, the circumstances yeah, we, we had, have changed, and Dermot's point is what is the difference, it, 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 was there any notable difference between saying no previously to say suddenly saying yes? Yeah, but we ha we didn't have the numbers until then. We ha we we were outnumbered. Uh, Ian was not the leader. Our party had never become uh, the, the DUP hadn't come to the uh, uh, it to uh, be the largest party then. Right. Right. So we couldn't do it without the without the numbers. Okay. Do you, do you think that maybe the fact that they were just signing up to policing and, and a number of other things that occurred at that time? <coughs> Signing what do you? There was a signing up to support of policing and law and order, for example, at that time that hasn't happened previously. So the political circumstances have changed? Yes, that's right. The political circumstances have changed at that time. That's okay. uh -huh. Gentleman at the back. Uh, thanks very much for this Sorry about speech that. and enjoying it. Um, I'm going to ask a question. Um, we were so used to listening to your husband saying no. I'm wondering what was the significant thing which led to the rule of Damascus conversion, where he suddenly was able to say yes. There's a school of thought among some people in early areas that at one time we thought he had been ill, one time we thought Dr. Pate had been ill, and maybe during that time before that he maybe experienced a religious conversion or something. <laughs> you could maybe add some light to that. A lot of people generally believe that. I'm genuine and I would say that. So I'm just wondering, you, you're the one who should have that. It's a similar point to Dermot's point, but he's basically saying, was there a moment in your late husband's life where did something happen that suddenly persuaded Ian to say, I've got to do this, I've got to go in power, I'm going to be first minister, there's going to be a Sinn Féin deputy first minister, now is the time to yeah, share power. What was there a light bulb moment? And the gentleman was suggesting that that your husband had not been at all well, and was that a moment when oh, you no, say, look, I have to get on with this? It, it, am, I, am, I, am I summarizing your question right. correctly? Okay, thank no, you. no, as I said before to the, to the, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, he had not, we had not the numbers then. We, we couldn't do it before then. We couldn't do it because we were not, uh, we didn't have the, the numbers to do it. But as Rhonda said, there were some circumstances that changed. Sinn Féin had signed up to policing. That's and right, that's right. It was those changed. things that were holding. I'm keen it's not to get bogged down in a complete yeah. political history <laughs> lesson, because I, I, I sense from you all, you're probably not, you're probably keen as well. So uh, there's a lady at the back. Uh, provided it's not a political history question relating to 2007. Uh, well, none of the ladies, by the way. <laughs> 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 Is it an absolute view that you have about abortion? Because there are occasions very clearly when there is evidence of fetal abnormality. And therefore, if a lady makes that choice, surely she has a choice and a decision to make. And that's a decision that she has to make. We should be in her shoes. And if we were in her shoes, or if you were in her shoes, would you make a similar decision? I know it's an ethical and a moral uh, debate, I mean, the sanctity of life for many is, you know, uh, takes absolute importance. But okay. I do think that at the end of the day, there are occasions when it 
perhaps is appropriate and justifiable. Did, did you get the question? No. It was a question about abortion, and it was, is your position on abortion an absolute position? In other words, if there was fatal fetal abnormality, would you be prepared to show some uh, movement on that? And can you, could you put yourself in the position of a, a, of a woman's shoes if she was yes. facing that? Is that a fair yes. summary? Yes. Yeah. I think that is a good question. And my answer is, I know it will not be liked by a whole lot of people, but as a, as a woman and a mother myself, if I had been told that beyond measure my child was uh, so uh, badly formed, whatever it happened to it in the womb, or whatever it happened <coughs> to it at conception, yes, I think that there is a case <coughs> Or there is a case to uh, prevent that. That uh, it's, it's an awful trauma to come through because I've seen people um, <coughs> have, have come through that, and it's been just dreadful for them. And I think there is that would be the one exception that I would make. Um, uh, and, or I would like to see it, but it would need to be done very, very carefully. I, you just can't say offhand, yes. But I do <coughs> have a lot of sympathy for anybody, any mother who finds herself in that position. Uh, and you, you just can't have it. There was a case not long ago here of a girl who had to go to England, and that should not have happened. That should not have happened uh, because the baby was already dead in her womb. and. Uh, I don't think, I think it was altogether wrong that that could not take place here instead of having that, that young woman to go through the, all that trouble. Okay, thank you. Maybe here. Um, I suppose my, my question is based on hope. Whenever the Good Friday Agreement happened, um, we as a nation were very hopeful. And I think now, I think a lot of people have lost hope. Um, in terms of our political climate and what's happening or not happening. Mm -hmm. And I suppose apart from getting on our knees as a people and praying, um, you know, how do you think we as a people can try to change what's happening? Yeah, I, 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 am a, I would agree with you that it is a, a very bad position uh, that we're in and how to get out of it is something that is baffling and it's very difficult to uh, say what should be done but you are right I do believe that people have in a large way uh, lost faith in in those who are in charge and I think prayer is a big <coughs> thing that we, we do need to pray about it and uh, but it certainly needs to uh, something needs to to give because we cannot go on like this continue. Are you an optimist? Are you a glass half full person generally? Yes, I would be. I, I'm not a, a three quarter empty. <laughs> 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 yes, I would uh, look on the bright side and be hopeful that things will, but at times I, I must say <coughs> I am concerned. Do you think your do you think your faith makes you a cheerier, more optimistic person? Well, it does, yeah. I don't, it, it, gives, it gives me light and it gives me hope. Because the, the Bible says of itself, thy word, God's word, is a light to our path, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And, and so it is. And I think the people are, everybody needs to get back to the word of God and to get back to the real basics uh, and the real serious things in life. And if we do that, everything else falls into its place. Otherwise, we're just on the downward slope. And I think we need all to turn to God uh, and uh, commit our lives and commit everything concerning us at this present time. We need to do that. Uh, I remember during the war years uh, when the king, the late king, called on the nation to pray otherwise England was 
Britain was lost, the United Kingdom was lost in that war, and we wouldn't have had the freedoms that we have today. And I think we need to get back to that. And people, uh, uh, there's a large number of people today, and uh, they call themselves Protestants and they call themselves Christians, but they never open the Word of God to find what His way is and what His guidance is. And I think that's a big loss. Uh, for a family, and as a, and it's families that make up make up the community, make up the country, and uh, make it what it is. And I think we've lost that in a large measure because people just ignore it. Are there any more questions before we before we close? One question here. Yes. Um, Mrs. Tracy, tonight you talk about minority. You have to, I have to give you the, the honour of the night for being able to weave in St. Patrick and Brexit. Even I couldn't do that. I'm very, 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 very impressed with your, your ability. If you didn't hear the question, that the gentleman was asking about have we lost something and that we embraced Patrick into this land, and yet here we are about to leave the European Union and be, in a sense, isolated and uh, if, I hope I'm summarizing your question correctly please forgive me if I've left something out but in a sense are we becoming uh, isolationist in a way that St. Patrick was embracing so that's the Brexit St. Patrick question <laughs> which I certainly wasn't anticipating this evening but thank you very much indeed that takes that certainly takes a discussion in a different direction that's for sure <laughs> Brexit and St. Patrick discuss <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't discuss it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't know enough, you know, well, uh, to put... Are we being, uh, I, suppose, I suppose a slightly truncated version, is there a sense that, that by leaving the European Union, uh, are we sort of becoming a little narrow-minded and are, will, will we stop embracing people and, and does that concern you that rather than reaching out, mm -hmm. um, with Brexit, we are becoming inward-looking? Well, I suppose it is people uh, we, we do need to have a wider vision and we do need to look at other you know outside ourselves because you can become so isolated that you're insulated and you just don't have any outside interest at all in other people and we do need that and uh, I, I don't know <laughs> what they what the uh, best way to answer that question is. Right. Okay. You can, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Do both. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree we've had a fascinating evening that has ranged from the Baroness's life and faith. We've touched on equal marriage, we've touched on abortion, we've touched on St. Patrick, and we've touched on Brexit. I think we've, we've done the full gamut of news and current affairs, so maybe you'd show your appreciation of Anna. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Baroness. Thank you so much. Can I ask one question? We're talking about legacy. Legacy, there is the Bandside Library. Mm -hmm. So maybe either yourself or Rhonda could tell us a little, give us a little advert for the Bandside Library because it's a fabulous facility. Uh, I don't think enough people, rather like the Sabbatical Centre, not enough people know about it. So 
would either of you like to Rhonda, would you say you would, you, would you do a yeah. would you do a sixty second advert for the Bandside uh, Library? We're located on the upper New Carriage Road in Belfast. We're not a lending library, we're a reading library. It's um it is home to my father's collection of books. He was an avid reader. Most of them would be theological books, but we haven't needed it, so there's all sorts of other books in it as well. And it was always Dad's intention when he retired that he would open his collection for the use of others. And he did that in a limited way. Um, he would have loaned his books and, and opened his collection privately. But we also use it as home to the Lord Banside Foundation, which is our charitable trust. And we also house Dad's private papers and sermon notebooks and Bibles. Uh, we don't have these open, but we do um, display them when the groups come in. We select people to display them. We take group visits. Um, we're open on a, from Tuesday to Friday, and we open on Saturday morning. We have a website, bandsidelibrary.com. Please be free to drop in or to ring and book a wee group in. We can take about 30 people comfortably at a time um, and you're very welcome to come and have a look and to learn more about him and um, we're really there to keep the story alive of what I think no matter your view of my father he was a public servant for over 50 years he was a minister in Belfast of the, the gospel which was his first love for over 65 years and I think anybody who serves the community deserves to be remembered. So please do feel free to visit us. And thank you for the opportunity to give us a plug. <laughs> 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 That just leaves us to, to wrap things up. We do have um, some nibbles in the art gallery. For those of you who might be a little peckish, please do go in because I went to Little's today, especially for you. <laughs> <laughs> please do feel obliged to go. Uh, we, will, we will all be circulating. Um, I would also like to just make a couple of presentations. Um, Baroness Paisley, this is for you, for you, but now you sit there because this is very heavy. <laughs> it's actually um, a piece of Morn granite. Mm -hmm. These days it's very hard to get Morn granite. If you go to Newcastle, it's built with Chinese granite, which isn't the same thing at all. <laughs> um, so, but it's heavy, so I'm going to leave this. I'll give it to Rhonda. Um, and I can give you... Yeah, a bunch of flowers. A bunch of flowers, <laughs> so there we go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. to show our appreciation thank you um, for coming tonight and for guiding us and for thoroughly entertaining us uh, in such a professional manner we have given this to you oh that's great so, thank thank you. You. Um, we will continue our series uh, on the first Thursday of next month we have another Baroness Baroness May Blood if you're not on our um, list please get onto the list because that's going to be another very popular in conversation with. Okay, so thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.